Welcome to another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast with me, James Roberts, transformational coach, two-time Paralympian, and TEDx speaker. I have another awesome episode for you today, so let's get straight into it. And on today's show, I've got Ricky Khan. Between hey, two- nice hey, Ricky. Between 2001 and 2014, Ricky was assistant academy coach at London Wasps. He has coached British Army Rugby League at inter-service competitions, coaching the first 13 in 2018 and 19 to become inter-service champions and led them to the fourth round of the Challenge Cup, becoming the first armed forces side ever to make the fourth round. As well as that, he is the national seven squad assistant coach for Jamaican Rugby Footballer Union and is the head coach of UK Jamaica Croc Sevens and currently to round it all off is the team manager and backs coach at London Scottish so welcome on to the show Ricky thank you for having me on to your show James real nice I have to make one slight correction I didn't lead the army because I think there's some other guys there that like Ben Taylor was our head coach and that. So I don't want to upset him at all, but, but I was definitely one of the coaches that led us to that. Definitely. So yeah, there's little things like that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the bats coach at London Scottish and help a little bit with the team managing as well. So yeah, we're all, we're all good apart from that. <laughs> good from there. So if we go before the coaching then Ricky, talk to us about your rugby career then because I'm assuming you don't go from nothing to going to coaching I'm assuming there's a backstory before that there was yeah and there's even a little bit more of a, a backstory before the backstory as well because um as a as a kid we um my sister and I we we're from a town called Clitheroe in Lancashire um it's more famous now in sports terms because of see that's where Michael Bisping's from he was obviously the UFC world champion so he stood up the road from me played rugby with his brother Conrad but uh, up on the hill there, on Pendle Hill, is a ski slope, a dry ski slope. And we, my sister and I, we got into doing um, just, you know, doing skiing as a hobby. And I ended up getting into like, the England school squad and then competing internationally. So I used to be a skier in a, you know, up till I was about 18 years old, doing international skiing. Um, but, my, uh, but from there, I had a coach, actually, who was involved as a youngster. When he was younger, sorry, coaching the Wigan Rugby League academy sides and youth, and I, I just got into rugby that way. Started to watch the games more and more. Became a Wigan fan, played a bit of rugby league, rugby league. Uh, then joined Blackburn Rugby Club because it was a near, you know, a club the nearest club to me that had like a youth section and a couple of mates played there, and that was it. Just fell in love with the game really, and, and just that that element of you know hitting people and getting hit back and stuff, and the beers and everything and and going out so yeah so that was that so I was was a player first so I, my dad said to me if I was going to stop doing the skiing I had to sort of take another sport seriously to sort of fill that void so I I said you know I'm set my target on trying to get into the county side and, and I did in my first uh, first couple of seasons of playing rugby got into the county side playing for Lancashire ended up playing for the north um, and then when I was 18 uh was able to then come down south to Brunel University on, on, on an unconditional offer, so the old Borough Road College, and end up at the Academy at Richmond playing um, playing rugby for for um, for Richmond uh, under 19s, under 21s, I've all. So that's uh, that's a brief summary of, of the playing side of it. Um, I did go on to play senior rugby for Richmond for the first team because I was part of that group of players that when Richmond went into administration, the same as time as when London Scottish did actually. And they then departed the Premiership. I was in that parachute season where they weren't sure where they were going to go. So I played a mixture of uh, first team games and uh, for the Saxons, various different different uh, guys is playing for Richmond that season and then left there to play for, to sign for Preston Grasshoppers with the Juice and Leagues, National Leagues. And then sadly got another injury, um, which meant it was one of those decisions that was, do I just stop playing and... Do you know what I mean? To call it a day, or do I try to sort of pursue and push through? And the physio said that the damage that I'd received, that by the time I was sort of in my forties, the arthritis and the the wear and tear on the body were quite serious. And now I'm 42. She was 100 percent right. I'm now hobbling around on my heels like some mornings and taking painkillers for for uh, for fun at times to try and sort of get rid of the <laughs> the pain and the soreness and everything. But but that's it. So I then transitioned from. Um, 
from playing to coaching sort of around about what, I was what 2021 and uh, started off at the minis and juniors at, at Wasps. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's that's the brief playing sort of career where I got to to where, where I started then coaching. So we go back to the skiing days, Ricky, for a moment. Did you kind of get second looks at you just because of the colour of your skin? Because you think skiing, you think predominantly white. Yeah, and you get the usual jokes, you know, like obviously Cool Runnings was a, a film when we were we were kids and stuff like that. So you get the usual, oh, it's like Cool Runnings and and blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it was, the ir- irony is there was a kid called Ruben Caravilla who same initials as me and he came from the States, didn't make it into the US team. He was a black kid and he was unbelievable. Wiped the floor with everybody in the UK. In the UK, And we happened to have the same colour chat suits and that. So it was one of those situations where people would come up to me, high-fiving me thinking I was in. I guess with the helmet and ski goggles on, you can forgive people for that a little bit. But but yeah, you know, as far as my, uh, as far as my, my anybody who knew me, I was I was judged quite a lot on how well, I competed and I can, you know, I won, I won races. I was mixing it with some of the top guys and everything. And so I was there on, um, you know, there on merit, definitely. But the older I got, the tougher it got was I found I didn't go to the world schools, for example, because um, my coach at the time, there was two of us who were going for that last spot. And it was basically, well, whoever finishes seeds the highest or finishes better, you know, highest in these races, does better, will go. And I did. And then, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to go. But the the other guy, his dad was one of the managers. And you just sort of think, well, that's just, you know, it's one of those life lessons you learn. And that, that was one of the reasons why I stopped doing it, because I thought, do you know what? I've, I've, I reached my ceiling, I think. I wasn't going to go any, any higher. Certainly not in the GB system anyway. Um, but what I should have done, and it's one of my biggest regrets, is I should have represented my mum's and dad's country, which which is Guyana. And uh, one of my friends did it for South Africa. He left the British system and represented South Africa at the Olympics. And, you know, I don't, I don't remember where he finished, but the fact he got to be an Olympian and do it was was amazing. And you'll know that yourself from, from your career. It's, it's something I wish I did it. And it's one of the biggest regrets that I have is that I was too proud at the time. I wanted to be there as a British skier. I wanted to be there as a, you know, a proud Brit and everything. And really, I should have gone, actually, I want to go to the Olympics. I should have, I should have done it that way you know it would have been funded by myself no doubt and everything but you're chucking quite a lot of money down the drain as a skier anyway to be fair and so it's uh so it wouldn't have been anything anything above beyond and i think now i wouldn't be able to do it as in not now because i'm an old get but back then i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to do it you wouldn't be able to do it as easy now because obviously different layers of qualification to try and get in it but but at the time it wasn't quite as a let's say as a well the safeguard it wasn't quite probably what it is now chucking me down those slopes with those those kind of guys probably it's probably a good thing I didn't go but but yeah it was it was it it was great time absolutely loved it loved being up in the mountains and everything but yeah people did always sort of raise their eyebrows a bit when you walked into a bar or a cafe or something and took your helmet and goggles off and they kind of oh you know what I mean? didn't expect to see you here type of thing but uh but it was more uh, no one actually said it it was always just like the raising of eyebrows more than anything it's like re- a little bit of like real life cool runnings then. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the irony is some of our, um, we talk about, we joke about because uh, the Jamaican rugby seven sites, sometimes we joke about call it cool ruckins. Or, um, <laughs> but um, some of the, um, some of our lads actually, um, there's there's three of our squad currently from the UK side of things are, are actually in the Jamaican bobsled team. So they um, they went to the trials and qualified and they ju- I think they competed in the Europa Cup and everything and that's just that's just been and gone and obviously the season's not on at the minute but they competed in those uh, I think in Innsbruck in Germany in the last last few legs um, for Jamaica so yeah it's a there's quite a cool sort of uh, full circle sort of moment really in a way which is cool and if we fast forward now to the present and you obviously with your coaching uh, career now Ricky What's it be? What was it like if we touch upon the first one? Because I'm going to ask you two different questions. What was it like to be in and around the players and the coaching staff of the England under 20s to start with? And what did you learn? So I was lucky actually. I was there. Um, I was at the. It was at the Lensbury, and I was there with um, with work originally. We happened to have a conference at the Lensbury Hotel, where England were training, and so my full time job is in medical sales. 
and so we were there and I think it was around Christmas, but but it was just before the Junior World Cup, um, which is an under 20 thing. So, but one of my players who I used to coach when I was at Henley, um, Rory Teague was the head coach for um, England under 20s. Um, he was also, he had at the time just been appointed the skills coach for, for the England um, senior team. And so I saw him there and he happened to be in the bar when I was there, when we were out in the conference. And I, and he said, why don't you come along and, and have a look what we're doing? And, and, and you know, invited me there. So the day after our conference finished, I went out and, uh, and managed to sort of go and uh, shadow him for a little bit and watch some of the sessions and learn it. And it's, it's brilliant. The, the one thing that really struck me actually at the time was, and you know, I'd, I'd been in the academy and player myself, and coach these lads but usually at the, the lower end so my lads would usually sort of from 18 and either leave the academy or go up into the regional academy stuff is the size of these players and how much more developed they were um physically than they were when we were academy players like they were they you know they're young men yeah they are young men they're 20 19 20 years old but their um their conditioning and their stature and everything was is, is unbelievable do you know what I mean they it, it was a, a bit of an eye opener, but but yeah, it was it was great. The at the time that that whole process through England was was obviously flying at the time and everything, and and I, st I still think they are. You know, they, there's still a lot of things there that you know. You, the, the, I think the training is is, is top notch when you go. So <clears throat> the good thing for me was um, a lot of the stuff that we do at, at club level and everything they do at that same level at the international level. But it's just a little bit quicker, and a little bit harder, and a little bit, you know, a little bit stronger sort of thing. And and so um, so yeah, it was really it was it was nice to have those contacts to be able to sort of just you know be invited to go in and see it, but also being part of the environment of seeing what they were doing, and and being able to gauge yourself against that as well is is for me it was it was really um really rewarding and really helpful, you know, put it down as um what do you call it, CPD, is it sort of like continued professional mm. development um, and just sort of picking up some new small-sided games, picking up some of the skill things they did, watching what some of the players did one-to-one. -one. So Rory, you know, obviously he was doing this skill stuff with the senior team, but watching him do some of the passing drills with a couple of his players at the end and what they were doing with the scrum halves and fly-offs, um, it all sort of goes in and you've got to process it and think, okay, how can I use that, <clears throat> use that with my players? So, um, so yeah, it was a brilliant, awesome environment. And this is where you haven't touched upon this, Ricky. I'm assuming you were back in, in your playing <laughs> career as well. And would you coach? Don't look at anymore. But yeah, <laughs> certainly don't look at anymore. I know, like most people go, were you a hooker? And I was in rugby <laughs> league, and so I'll say, yeah, 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 totally, I was a hooker. But then, obviously, in rugby league, it's a bit more like a scrum half. But yeah, I started off, started off as a, um, a scrum half because that's you know like for like transitioning across the two codes those those that's position but i know a lot of people say you I came down south and I, I got put straight out on the wing and and centers as an outside back i used to be quite quite fast back then um and you do hear this story quite a bit going oh, i only put you there because you were black etc etc but in my case i have to say the scrum offs that were playing there at scrum off were better than me and i was just grateful to sort of be um still considered good enough to be playing in the in the starting 15 to be honest so if, they, if that's where they felt i should play out on the you know either at center or on the wing then so be it and do you know what i say the same thing to my daughter now she's a she's a netball and she's part of an elite club um in the area and she she loves being goal attack she loves playing center and she's a bloody good goal she shoots at like 80 percent 90 percent when she does her uh, 100 shots a day and all that but she's playing goal defence at the minute. And I said, it doesn't matter. I said, it just why broadens your capability as a player, makes your value higher as a player. And also, you know, if that's where the coach deems you're the best player, you're in the starting team. You're, you know, you're in that, that top side at the minute. So you've just got to sort of suck it up and get on with it, you know? So, so yeah, so I was a back. In answer, long answer to your question, I was a back. Um, and that's where my most of my speciality is really when I'm when I'm coaching. Do you find it hard then to 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 kind of educate your daughter on that in terms of the looking at versatility as a as a as a positive as opposed to um, obviously we've long transitioned uh, from sports of 
you know, you've got to stick to one sport. And I think I've seen a few athletes on LinkedIn kind of saying, um, I can't remember the name who it was, but they didn't they didn't specialize in sprinting and athletics till like quite late. I was like, okay, wow, that's quite that's quite an achievement. And they were an Olympian. Um, but how do you get that across to your daughter to kind of um grin and bear it i'm trying to think use my words wisely she's, she's um she's lucky both both myself and my wife we're, we're sport we're a sporty household we're a sporty family you know um my sister is as well with her kids you know i was up on the bank holiday and then both my nieces play hockey and they were playing against each other it was like a, an inter-club game and stuff like that and and it, it was great because i was telling my older niece i'm going to support my younger niece because she's younger and she you know what i mean and she's not quite as good as the older niece but they're both brilliant so that is, it's, it's, it's giving them that sort of almost like from a young age, you say it's okay to fail, it's okay to lose, but it's how you deal with it. So Evie, my Evangeline's my daughter, so we call her Evie for short. She's been playing netball probably since she was a bit like a rugby tot stage. I reckon about three or four. She's probably been playing netball in uh, sort of a netball nippers. A brilliant coach called Lisa, and and she still does some stuff with my daughter now. Um, you know, alongside her coaches at, at the club that she's at. But I remember they played a game and she lost in this game and she came off and she was crying and she was stamping her feet and everything. She wouldn't shake hands with the, they make them all shake hands at the end of the game, pre-COVID obviously. And um, and she came on and I sent her back on and I said, I don't care that you lost. I said, I, I said, but I do care that you're not, you're being a bad sport. And she was, you know, she did go and do it. She didn't want to do it, but she did. And then I explained to her that, you know, these lessons are, you might, everyone hates losing. Not that anybody who likes losing, um, but you've got to do it gracefully. And that's the thing is that there's, if you, you know, you lose badly or you lose just narrowly, whatever, it's, it's better. Like she'll go up to the opposition coaches now and players and say, good game, well played and stuff. Even if some of her teammates don't do that, she does make a point of doing it. And, or her opposition, I would say, you used to buy a beer for your opposite number at some clubs and stuff after the game. and um, you know, those principles she's carried through, to be fair to her, she has from that age, from then on, she has always been a good sport. She's, you know, she's head girl of her school. And I think it's those principles from sport that we've put into it, that you look after those people in and around you that don't necessarily look after themselves that well. And that's the same in sport, school, everything with her. And uh, yeah, she makes me massively proud. You can hear it, obviously, when I'm talking, I'm massively proud of my daughter, but it's more so that she's learned these lessons from an early age to say, okay, you might not be starting at goal attack where you want to play. That's the coach's decision. Your job is to make sure that you're in that, you know, that A team. If you're not in the A team and you're in the B team, there's nothing wrong with that. You've got to be the best player in the B team to then give yourself a chance of making the A team. And if you never make the A team, it doesn't matter because you just be the best player that you can be. And, and she gets that. We've always prepared her for for, for those sorts of challenges to sort of say I've used my own examples from my sport saying I knew I was better than certain players or I was better than certain skiers but because of politics and whatever reason you might not make it to to the big dance or whatever you know um, and that happens even as a coach as well I know certainly uh, you know I coach the Southwest under 18s at the minute and it took me a good number of years to get there and I funny enough we were cleaning up the house the other day and I found the box of letters rejection letters I always kept them I don't know why punish myself with them sort of thing or maybe one day when I get you know get to coach an England team I'll get to chuck them on a bonfire and exercise those uh, demons but but um but yeah I kept them and and we were laughing me and my wife because the number of different reasons that I got from different you know you know different interviews and stuff like that you know you're not tall enough you're not you know this I know joking about the tall thing I am sure but but um but yeah it's it was it's you've got to deal with those failures. And when I did finally get into the Southwest under 18s coaching team, uh, one of the, the England team managers said to me, said one thing he really admires is the tenacity and the resilience to sort of say, you know, I want to do this. It's something that I want to have a tick in the box and I want to do a good job of it. And I could have quite easily thrown the towel in years ago and said, okay, I'm just never going to make it. Uh, for whatever reason, sometimes your face doesn't fit. And that was that was that's how I was feeling about it. So I'm trying to give her those lessons so that what I went through and the pain that I felt, she's able to deal with it better. Because I didn't have, in a sporting term, I didn't have it. My my dad and mum moved over from Guyana um, in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s sort of time, and lived in London. 
dad used to, dad was talking about it on the weekend, he would go try and look for a place to rent or live in London and people wouldn't let him do it because he was black or Asian or whatever we want to call, whatever the labels are, BAME these days and everything. But he was, um, um, he always said to my sister, who's, who's a GP, what, nobody can ever tell you you can't do what you want to do. And, but you've got to always prepare yourself to work a little bit harder, maybe in some, some walks in life to get what you want, get to what you want to achieve. And so I've tried to put that into, instill that into my kids as well, that you could be the best goal shooter or the best swim or whatever, but you still might not get picked. And it's going back to what we were talking about earlier with like, say a Sam Simmons situation. He's made it to the British Lions, but he wasn't playing for England. Is that, he's accepted that hasn't he you know I've never seen the guy moan about it or anything like that he's just done it and so sometimes you've just got to suck it up and be like okay what do I do I'm gonna, he's, he's carved up for his for his club for extra chiefs and that's been rewarded with the fact so yeah if I can if I can instill those lessons into my kids then I think I've done a good job do you know what I mean and I've learned the lessons that I have through sport to be able to do it mate do you think through your own setbacks, then you've had the just reward with um, obviously uh, shadowing. Uh, I, must, I must call them something else then. Uh, Saint Helen, Saint Helen Saints, in, in, and obviously that 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 staff they had quite recently, and then obviously to uh, shadow uh, the Italian team ahead of a sick budget which pretty much that's you that's pretty much that's a pretty good achievement to to shadow a team before a six nations game it's it yeah and it, it, I've, I've been out i've been really privileged to have some of these opportunities and how it comes around is rugby it's probably the same in your sport you know it's a real community and people help each other out the um the saint helens the saint helens stuff with the armies with it we've got a, a very close link with them I'm a Wigan fan, so it was a little bit tough for me, but uh, to be going to St. Helens and seeing how amazing they were and everything, singing their praises, but it was. Um, and our co- the coaching staff at, um, and management staff at, at the Army have worked with a guy called Ian Talbot before, and so he was the guy who helped helped us do some of our training with the with the Army Rugby League um, for the, not just the Challenge Cup, but for the in-service, inter-services stuff. And just being in that environment is brilliant. So that was that link through there. Ironically, one of the players, Johnny Lomax, is the brother-in-law of one of my players from when I was head coach at Maidenhead, at Keohane. And um, he, um, and so again, it's, these old circles all sort of like loop together and, and tie in. So that was that link. But the, the shadowing the Italian national side, again, rugby's a small world. Connor O'Shea was coaching them at the time. And he's, well, he's I think his wife, or he's very good friends with, my ex-captain at Maidenhead, Simon Cripps, and he put us in contact because Saracens had just had their um, uh, 3G pitch put in. So a lot of the premiership teams used Maidenhead, who also had theirs put in at the same time um, to do their training at. So I, as head coach at the time then, um, we just had a dialogue and everything, and kept in touch. And um, I asked him, would it be okay? And he said, yeah, no problem. To Tommaso Allen, Tommy Allen, as I know him as, is there was the fly half who's just signed for Harlequins. Actually, he was one of my Wasp Academy players, and he was playing for Italy at the time. So it's these these things. It, the circles always link up, no matter. So that it's been a privilege. The also, thing that's funny about this is Conor O'Shea's uh, daughter also plays in the same team as my daughter, and actually is a goal attack for the netball team. And uh, so yeah, so <laughs> in the same netball team that she plays in the netball club. So yeah, it's a. Uh, like I said, all these all these different contacts in life. It, if I have asked at times, kind of be involved, but there's other times when you've been invited, and I've, I've always used those opportunities and those contacts to try and develop myself. You know, I'm not just turn up and just sort of stand there, just saying, "Oh, this is amazing." It's really watching what these guys are doing. Still, like any coach does, steal some of their drills and pretend it was yours and stuff like that, and uh, and do it that way. So yeah, so so yeah, they they they've been. Great opportunities, but as I always put them down as CPD as my continue, you know, continue professional development because you know that's that's you don't always get the chance with my job. I don't get a chance to go on all the different courses and, and see, so if I get a, get an opportunity to go and you know see some of the maestros at work, I'll I'll definitely go and do it. Do you think because obviously you don't have access to the courses because of your job? Do you think um, the 
the first hand knowledge or what's the word doing it through I'll call it repetition, repetition, but in terms of being able to see it, watch it, and ultimately participate on pre-COVID is more beneficial than doing it in a classroom. I think both are really valuable. Um, I'm really, if you know, if I, the courses that I have, I'm able to go on and I will, do you know what I mean, when I get the opportunity, do go on them, is um, the theory is always great and there's some coaches there that have never played the game necessarily and or to a really really high level and but they're brilliant coaches and but then also they've not been in an environment like that so you can have the conversation with them saying they'll say oh this is what i want to see this is what you know this is how i visit my my thing was like great be fortunate to be a good uh, to be a good enough player to be in that environment as a youngster um being fortunate as a coach to be able to put myself in this so gelling the two things together to me is, is the best thing ever. Learn the theory and everything, but then to see that theory in practice, there's nothing better than to be sort of seeing and breathing it and everything to to understand like, how does that, how would I tweak it? How would I make that better for my guys? Because, you know, they may not be able to do X, Y, Z. I went to a session on the back of the, the, the stuff when um, Harlequins trained at, at Maidenhead. Um, I managed to go down to watch Harlequins train a few times at, at there, at the Surrey Sports Ground. And John Kingston was their forwards coach at the time, who was the director of rugby at Richmond when I was an academy player. And I, I didn't watch any of the back stuff. I went and watched the forwards train because, because I was a head coach. I wanted to learn more about what the forward do and the dark arts of the scrummaging, as they say, and all this sort of stuff. But, but I can, you know, I can run a back session with my eyes shut, and and what we do. Rugby league's very similar. A lot of the stuff we do in rugby league is um, is like what we would run in a back session with the movement, and you know we're not smashing rucks apart or mauling and stuff like that. But part of my role uh, and part of my own development is I wanted to see what they were. They'd won the premiership. They were the you know they were the number one team in England at the time. I wanted to see what they were doing, what their pack was doing, what drills they were doing, so that I could then take it back to my forwards coaches and be like, hey. This is what I've seen. Um, I'm never, you're never allowed to video any of these things, obviously, because of, you know, they might sell it to wasps or something like that. I don't know. But but um, but it was but it was brilliant because there was they did they did some stuff that I was like, wow, I didn't realise that would that translated like that for the forwards as you know what I mean. It was they were doing some sprint work and it was just literally two, three step bursts. I won't give too much away, but they were <laughs> But literally, it was it was all looking at the engagement and their body position, and at what point they can hold themselves before they then fall forward. And it was it was really it was a real good eye opener on some of the some of the stuff they do. They're using judo belts. Uh, I think now they've got probably stronger bands and stuff, but using judo belts to sort of hold them up from the hips and get them into the stronger uh, scrimmages. And I, now I see everybody using it. So it's one of these things where you see these things being tried at Premiership level or international level, and then next minute. SAQ, you know, speed agility stuff. When that came out, everybody bought ladders, poles, and cones, and everything. It looked like a, you know, like a landing strip at Heathrow. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> everyone was chucking out, but, but it, but it's good to see because people are willing to try it. You know. Well, it's 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 it it it, it crosses over into every, every aspect of it. Um, I've even well, it, it's my my days in 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 the corporate world in the gym ladders things like that and using uh what kind of exercise is it walking put walking it's not walking press up but walking plank just yeah. so you've got a, you've got uh a visual cue to be able to look at that you, you you're um not I cheating think, or anything like that i think some of it's lost as well i mean i mean i'm from an i love everyone's like oh do you still do the ladders still love doing the SAQ, the footwork stuff and everything some guys like it some guys hate it some coaches they go oh, it's not relevant to this and it's like yeah well, sometimes it's just fun just to see what people could do it and everything like but there's um there's something that we used to do so much on swiss balls and literally there'd be lads they'd be doing pistol squats on it or they'd be standing on it passing the ball between each other you don't see people doing it as much anymore but there was a real buzz at times when people were you know they're passing medicine balls three kilogram five kilogram medicine balls whilst kneeling upright on a med on a swiss ball and um just to sort of tighten in the core and stuff like that. And you don't really see as many people doing it now. And 
I remember seeing like Josh Lucy in the gym at Twyford Avenue and he was squatting on a, you know, a couple of the SC guys holding the squat bar with, it looked quite heavy, quite a few discs on it. And he was doing squats on um, on Bozu balls and on Swiss balls and stuff like that. And it's just, the core stability is un- unbelievable. But I don't know, I don't know if there's a health and safety issue there or something, but people don't do it as much anymore now. Well, but. Prob- probably. But then obviously the, the condition, the strength and conditioning is on another level of well, when you played and probably when I was and when I was in sport it's probably changed so look at look, look at the likes of uh, Harlequins um with oh not John Bishop it's Bishop Adam Bishop being right. a former rugby player himself and obviously a strong man now it's like well that's a good strength and conditioning coach now because he's freaking very very strong but very very athletic and he's played the game in the part and very, very good player at, at that as well. Mate, definitely. I mean, the most, the most, I remember I was fortunate enough to be like one of the, the academy staff at WAS when, um, when, when they were obviously they had that amazing period where they won Heineken Cups and they won premierships and they won everything. And Sean Edwards was there, and obviously he's a, a hero of mine that from being a Wigan fan growing up, Warren Gatlin, and Ema Geek, and those kind of coaches were around. But one of the person that was, was one of the biggest influences really on me was actually Craig White, um, you know, and his, you know, what he did was unbelievable. I thought he revolutionised our strength and conditioning rugby. And I remember turning up one day and was like, what, what's going on? And they had all this strongman equipment out, you know, like the Atlas balls. I know a lot of people do it now, but at the time, nobody, nobody was doing stuff like that. And it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it was just that, that that's where this, I first heard the word like dynamic strength and where it comes from and, and what we do in throwing and judo and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and it was brilliant. I, I still keep in touch with him now, but um, I still have him as one of the most influential people um, for, for seeing. I, think, I remember seeing some of the guys um, from Harlequins. I used to live in Richmond, so you would see them down by the river on the sunny days and that, you know. I used to be able to take my top off back then, but I don't dare do that now. <laughs> and, um, but, the, um, but yeah, there were some lads there and they'd gone from Harlequins to Wasps and Craig White was still there and had the likes of uh, Paul Strigdon, so Bobby. He's, he's just been taken, I think he's gone on the Lions tour as well as the SNC guy again. Um, and they, they'd never seen anything like it. They, they, the difference from them being Harlequins to then coming to Wasps, at that time where Wasps was... was the best team in the country, and they said they, they never they've never been put through it like that, you know, and and felt so fit and strong, but just done things so differently. And and I think he's he's absolutely led the way in rugby as as far as um, as far as strength and conditioning goes. It's doing the unconventional, isn't it? It's 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 only viewed as different because it's like well, we've always done the conventional the. The, what what I call classes, you know, comfortable, because you're always yeah. telling people to get to be comfortable being being un, uncomfortable. Uh, it doesn't matter. Probably you would have tested this, Ricky. Ricky, no matter what sport you are, preseason is shit. <laughs> 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 but you've got to if you you've got to do it because ultimately, if you want to play and be able to be able to uh, withstand, and you've played league, which is probably they would probably argue it's probably more uh you've got to have an engine than union and and the ball is in play a lot oh, more with union but the league is like a t- completely different beast uh but you've got to put in the the hours yeah. at the beginning I've got, I've got a friend of mine um a pl- one of my players who he's been with us at chino he's you know, think, a lad called james ties he does our analysis for us at London scottish as well and um he's He's, he's trialled up at Wakefield just recently for Super League because obviously, you know, the, talk about pre-seasons, obviously London Scottish, we had the longest pre-season, pre-season known to man and then didn't play obviously this season because we decided to sort of not compete in this year's championship with a view to come back in because just because of COVID and there was, there's no relegation from it and it was a financial decision too. However, he's one of our players and so he wanted his rugby. He went and trialled up at Wakefield and gave it a good shot. I think they were, they were very interested in him, but he's playing now for, for London Scholars in League One. But the one thing he said to me, and I said to him, said, be prepared, because he was doing the training, I said, is to, this will be the next level of fitness that you'll be doing. And he phoned me up after his first training session. He said, you know, bloody hell, mate. So you weren't joking. He said, 
no, he's never experienced anything like that. He said it was brutal. He said he was, you know, felt sick. He was like, and he's a fit guy, you know, he keeps telling me good nick. And I said, people forget this. I said, in rugby league, the ball in play, I said, is what well, probably about 78 minutes out of the 80 that ball's in play because there's no line outs, there's no reset scrums. Once your set of six is over, it's getting handed over or you're running it back. Ball in play in rugby union. Actually, it's probably at best 38 minutes, probably through the 80 minutes, the ball's in play. And that's, I think I'm highballing a bit, to be fair. But it's that's that's how it is because of just because of the nature of the game. So, you're, I think I watched Wigan and Leeds play a couple of years ago, and it literally the ball didn't go dead. I think when they when they did the stats, the ball was only dead for like one minute of the game. The other 79 minutes of that game was just end, and they were out on their feet. And so you're absolutely right. Everyone hates it, but I've never I've never had as a player as a coach anyone in when people sort of moan about it in rugby union, say bloody hell, this is hard. It was a beasting and stuff like that. They've never experienced the pre-season rugby league, and that, that's the thing. They probably never. Well, some obviously some rugby union lads absolutely hate rugby league, and vice versa. Remember, I know I went to coach when I coached the army lads for the first time I had no other kit other than rugby union kit and, uh, and I didn't wear it again after that put it that way because I got absolute pelters often you know what I mean they were calling it rugby union and stuff like that and <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah but, but yeah you're, you're right mate the, the, I think rugby unions learned so much from rugby league they won't admit it but they really really have um, my strength the strength conditioner I work with with Jamaica and with London Scottish, Stuart Aimer, we and him are constantly talking about or sending each other clips of the, the S&C stuff from um, from Rugby League and just certain things. And and yeah, he's he's one of the guys. He's he, I like him. He's, he's like a Craig White in a lot of senses that he's very innovative in how he thinks and um, and like a real pleasure to sort of work with. But it's they're the kind of S&C guys I really like that are just willing to just just try new things with their athletes, you know. Well, you've got to now because ultimately everything has been done. So you need to find that whatever marginal gain that you'd be able to achieve. And what you mentioned of bringing up Wigan and Leeds, you didn't mention the rivalry between Yorkshire and Lancashire, let alone Wigan <laughs> and Leeds. So that's probably why it's ferocious of that intensity because ultimately, uh, well, we go in history, be history buff, War of the Roses. And pretty much the two counties hate each other. So, and Wigan and Leeds are one of the two major forces within the league. Thus, they're going to be always in contention. Uh, you could argue with, well, St. Helens, Wigan and Warrington within, gosh, 10 miles of each other at best. Uh, yeah, yeah. With this, with this Warrington, you know, you've got all them like, I mean, I don't know what's more brutal, like, you know, play, I mean, played in a Roses matches, do you know what I mean, as growing up and that, they're brilliant. and the number of people that used to come and watch them, even for like the, the youth games and stuff like that was, was unreal, do you know what I mean? But, but yeah, you're right, you know, it, it's funny, like my son was talking about this today, because we, we take him up to Warwick Castle, him and my daughter, and they do this, the, um, what do you call it, the jousting, don't they, in the nights, we'll have a fight. And they're from the House of Lancaster and the House of York. And they're always like, Daddy, who do you support? And I'm like, obvious, I'm from Lancashire. It's always going to be like <laughs> And so they do as well. So Kobe, my son, he plays on uh, Roblox and things. And he was uh, saying that he was telling his friends that, I'm not sure what game they're playing, but he asked them, oh, are you Red Rose or White Rose? And he says, if they're White Rose, I tell them that I'm the Red Rose. It's my dad's from Lancashire. And it's like, you know, it just kind of makes me feel a bit more prouder. Do you know what I mean? That I don't think he really understands it. He's only, what, eight. but but uh, he understands it enough that, it, that I care about it. So that's, that's the whole thing. Well, it's, it's the the Yorkshire people themselves are very, very, very patriotic, aren't they? You just look at the Brownlee brothers with triathlon. They had a Yorkshire flag alongside uh, a, a British one. Yeah. You probably would be hard to find maybe the Cornish, maybe do something similar. Uh Lancashire is probably too much of um, but a lot of football in Lancashire. A lot of football, I think, with my, obviously hatred between Manchester and Liverpool and things like that. Um, and, you know, the old counties. But it's probably the, the same of 
well, you've played both codes, you know, north-south divide. And, you know, the, the, the if we talk about the premiership in particular, well, I'm closer to sale, but Newcastle and sale, I've got pride yeah. of the north because pretty much they are uh, out there on an island and everybody is, well, bar obviously uh, Leicester, North, Northampton, and whilst now being in Coventry, mm. it's below what for gap. Uh, so they've probably got that pride to, well, Sale is proud to be a Northwest club. We're going to get people from in around Greater Manchester, Lancashire, and come into it's North Wales a little bit. I think the ACE programme, um, they've got out of Myers Co College in uh, in Preston, that sort of area. I think that's like that's the feeder up there. for. But it always used to strike me, I never realised how many teams below the Premiership were actually from Yorkshire, like, you know, the, the Rotherhams, the Doncasters. You've got so many of those teams that, you know, uh, there used to be a team called Wharfdale and sadly they've fallen from... But you could go up there, you couldn't get a more Yorkshire place if you tried, do you know what I mean? You were, you were the right in the middle of the Pennines and round the pitch is a dry stone wall and, do you know what I mean, the sheep sort of grazing sort of right in the car park, that sort of thing. But they were a national one side for years, you know, and we're talking the old national one, like the old sort of championship sort of level. And um, and now they've fallen down. But but I was amazed at how many. I was. I mean, Yorkshire's a massive county, and so it was always tough for uh, for Lancashire playing against them. But they were they're some of the best games. But the irony is, said Lancashire, I think of the they've won the county championship most times out of anyone, and they're one of the counties that are really sort of still proud of it. But it's, it's sad. I coached the Berkshire County side, and we're in the t- we're in the third tier of the county tour, and we do it. it we we the lads are proud to play for the county but it's not the same level as a Cornwall or a Lancashire or a Yorkshire, just because of the simple size of the county. But we're trying to sort of instill that, you know, it is, it is an honour to play for your county because my club in Blackburn, I'm not sure if it is still there, but my shirt and definitely my photograph was up in the club because they were proud that I think no one had played for Lancashire for quite a few years before we had, in my, our Colts age, there was a handful of lads that um, that managed to make the county sides for, for Colts, 17s, 18s, everything. And they're really proud of it. Whereas down here in Berkshire, for example, a lot of kids put, they don't have all their shirts up and everything because I guess the clubhouse will be full. But it's a shame, really, because it should be an honour to play. You know, it's the first start, it's the first step of your uh, representative rugby, I think. You know, county, then divisional, and then national. Um, but yeah, Lancashire, Yorkshire, um, Cornwall, Devon, at the senior level for county, they're massively proud. They want to keep it alive, the Bill Bowman Cup and everything, because it's. They'll fill Twickenham. If Lancashire and Cornwall play each other. Cornwall get to the final. It's a proper day out for him, you know. Like that is it the black and gold army, like Trelawney's army, and they literally fill the stadium. And it's it's really. I mean, one of my ex players posted it on his Facebook today uh, for when he played there. The stadium was rammed, you know, not as rammed as it would be on an England international, obviously, but considering it was just like a county competition, unreal, absolutely unreal. Do you think from that basis, Ricky, is, is re-educating players to, 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 for, to, to one, on the one hand, reminisce of, uh, of the history of it, but kind of to remind them of it is a big deal and it is a big deal because ultimately, like you said, it's the first step in on, on, on the road to greater thing but for some players that might be the big that might be the, the the highlight of their career and to to utilize myself as the example not to not really live in the moment and to to soak it up of of all of of, of the experience i'm not saying getting soaked up and you and and, and, the, and the experience overwhelms you but to to soak it all up because heaven forbid that could be the, the twilight of your career? I think so. I mean, I've tried to say this to, to some of the lads that, that you come in to, to, to contact coaching with the um, with the under 18 sort of programme and everything is that, you know, so I'm fortunate enough, I was coaching the county 18s at for Oxfordshire, but I'm doing the divisional stuff for, for South West. And that's part of the, what's called the aspirational pathway. And, why they have it is that they, they talk about, so Joe Launchbury is a good example. He was, he's 
a lad who's gone through not the elite pathway. He was released by Harlequins when he was younger and he went to them with, and he's gone through more the aspirational pathway as a late developer. And they're talking more and more about it. And I think you're right. I think uh, there's two, 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 two ways that I'll look at this. The, the under 18s, they've got a great program in Berkshire. And that obviously I can talk about it because I'm in Berkshire, live in Maiden and everything and see what they do. And they, um, they've had a good cohort of lads coming through and they make it a real honour to be part of your county and the, the social media behind it and everything they do. At senior level, it was non-existent. It was literally, it was up for playing county at the end of the season when I first sort of came on board. We were scrabbling around for a squad still on a Friday night before a game and everything. And so, yeah, so, beg your pardon, the... Um, yeah, so these these lads, they sorry, at the senior level, what we started to do was we were contacting the clubs and just say, hey, send us down your players and that. Some some coaches, some clubs, for whatever reason, they don't like county or whatever, or the, mess, the message never got through. So what we started to do was speaking to the captains because people would say to us, hey, why didn't we know about county? Or we'd love to have played, et cetera, et cetera. Not everyone's like that, but some guys did. So we changed our tack and started speaking to the captains of the teams opposed, as opposed to the coaches, managers, directors of rugby, chairmen, because we thought actually maybe they've got the finger on the pulse a little bit more for what the players want as opposed to, and I get it, being a coach, I'm a coach myself, sometimes you want to protect your your flock, so, so to speak, but I think it's the players' right to decide whether they want to play or not. So what we do is we take that group of captains out for a beer and a curry and a chat and everything and say, this is what we're doing. This one, The first time we did it, we had over 40 guys turn up training and and it was just that the way we sold it was like, yeah, we'll try and get you kit because all rugby players love kit. Um, we'll try, you know, we'll make sure there's beers put on afterwards. But, you know, we, the county do have like a, an honours tie that they give. Uh, if you play, I think it's three consecutive uh, campaigns or something or however many games. Or it could actually be, I think about, no, it could be five campaigns. So you get 15 caps, whatever, 50 games, you then get your honours tie. and. It's it starts to have a bit more pride. We did a um, our shirt present when we selected our squad. We did a shirt presentation at Sanders. One of our coaches, uh, Stu Sylvester, I coached the Army Rugby League with as well. I coached Berkshire Rugby Union with him, the county stuff. And he's a uh, he's now a major in the army. And he sorted us out one of the um, uh, one of the buildings or one of the messes at um, Sanders Military Academy. And we're there, suit you know, with our shirt size presented the county ties, and and just made it feel a little bit more special for these players to say, you're not just turning up because you're the last, you know, last chicken in the shop. We've selected you to play for your county, and that now has got a bit of a path coming through. And um, Seb Reynolds, who's the Rams coach, they're in National One. They finished runners up in National One last year. He coaches the under twenties, so there's a good pipeline of players. I'm I'm sort of at the under 18s with the Southwest. And then some of those players could go to him in the under 20s and then some of those under 20 players come and play for us in the seniors. There's a pathway now where there wasn't before. So there is much more pride in playing for a small county like Berkshire than there, there ever has been. There used to be back in the day because you have some of the lads who went to Twickenham and the summers, and, and it was a real honour to play. But there was no money involved in the game then, mm. whereas there is now. And because it's amateur, this level that most of these lads play at, you've got to give them a carrot and the carrot is going to Twickenham and it's stash and stuff like that. But otherwise, why would they want to play three more games at the end of a season when they put the body through, say 30 games already? It's just not, do you know what I mean? So, so yeah, it's, it's a tough sell, but there is much more pride in it now than there ever has been, I think. And obviously from a different perspective now, Ricky, what's it like for rugby in Berkshire now that they've lost London Irish from Reading to Brentford do you know what I don't know I think I do believe I think because they're a premiership club Berkshire still is their still their catchment area it's still their um, each premiership club has got a a catchment area and Wasps uh, when I just finished at Wasps obviously they moved up to Coventry and there was a big hoo-ha as in who you know who gets what sort of bits of Gloucestershire or Oxfordshire or Buckinghamshire? I guess a bit like a divorce, people were trying to like <laughs> kind of grab everything, you know what I mean? But, um, but as far as I know, London Irish's catchment area will still be Berkshire and I'm guessing Surrey or part of Surrey. 
because they'll probably split that north and south story with Harlequins. Everyone's got different like I think uh, Saracens, even though where they play, they've got like Kent and the South Coast, stuff like that. So everyone's got their their own. I'm pretty sure you read it all the time as in, oh, that player's with, he's been poached for this or whatever. And you sort of get these emails occasionally that come out going, and why is he playing for Gloucesters, such and such, when he should be playing for Wasp or Northampton or et cetera. So, um, so as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, London Irish is still, still basically uh, part of Berkshire and that. And obviously, we're um, with London Scotch. We're training at Maidenhead, uh, or going to be training at Maidenhead, like we were last year. And so that was like, oh, are you going to be running things like? I'm like, well, no, we're not a Premiership team. So, but we're happy to sort of get involved in the community and stuff like that. Obviously, but yeah, it's very much still uh, London Irish's territory. To be fair, so won't be crossing that bridge. Well, that's where it gets very uh, uh, muddy waters with sport, things like that. So we won't go into that too much. My penultimate question to you then, Ricky, as we round up to the, the end of the, the episode, is I'm going to ask you two questions instead of the one that I normally ask the guest. If you had to sit down with any athletes that are alive for that matter, first question, who would that be? And my second question would be, any coach dead or alive, and who would that be? Uh, players wise, I've always had the, you know, I'm a racing, like my, my out and out hero is always Jason Robinson for because he was a small, small guy as well. And we do, you know, have the occasional message on Instagram. I'm, I'm on this WhatsApp group with guys like uh, Hugo Monia. When when all the the um, you know kick racers and out of rugby and Black Lives Matter and all those sort of things, I. I basically I'm I'm one of three uh, black or ethnic coaches that that coach rugby union in the top two flights of rugby, um, and pro- probably one of the only ones as a as a first team coach. So I got quite a lot of attention really suddenly on that, and got some really lovely messages from guys like Paul Hull, who still to this date is what is the only director of rugby that is a black guy that's ever been in in, in in Premiership rugby, which is quite sad, you know, um, considering all the top players, uh, black players and ethnic players that have been being rugby. But James Robinson is one of the guys who, when he, when he he messaged, you know, he, he I think he liked a message or he sort of, you know, so I was like, oh, brilliant, awesome, do you know what I mean? Because I've, I've grown up sort of, you know, absolutely loving the guy. But then there's people like Billy Boston and Clive Sullivan, Ellery Hanley. Do you know what I mean? Ellery Hanley was like, I think one of the first, he was the first GB coach out of any sport to be a black guy. Do you know what I mean? Because uh, he coached the Great Britain Rugby League Lions um, in that series. And, and, he was a, and he was an unbelievable player as well. You know, he, he the Aussies even say, you know, where rugby league's their number one sport, that he would be in their Hall of Fame. He would be one of their top players if they were ever picking it. And so those kind of guys, are, for me, uh, uh, I watched that documentary the other day of Clive Sullivan and, and it's just it's just amazing, do you know what I mean? What these guys went through um, to you know to play a sport that they loved and to play represent the country. They weren't allowed to, you know, represent Wales at the time. Stuff, you know, it's like till the eighties before a black player actually played for Wales and stuff like that, which is believable. But all those players moved from those sort of towns in South Wales and everything up to the north of England, like the Clive Sullivan's, but you know, and they. What they achieved is unbelievable. So I know there's a handful there. You said one, but yeah, there's we'd probably a dinner party eating some uh, yeah, some jerk chicken or something around the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, coach wise, gosh, well, Ellery Hanley, do you know what I mean? As a coach, Paul Hull, I mentioned him as well. Um, gosh, do you mean know, I've I've always admired um you know, I was lucky, like I said, to be um to be employed. I was employed at, at London Wasp by a guy called Rob Smith. And he gave me, um, he gave me like my opportunity and sort of break into that sort of elite sort of level or elite club, you know, working for a club like Wasps and in the time when they were there, you know, working with guys like Joe Simpson, Danny Cipriani, those fellas. Um, for me, it was was awesome. It was it was brilliant. Christian Wade is another one that you know, seeing him as like a fourteen year old kid just absolutely carving up. But it was all under the umbrella of like Warren Gatlin and Sean Edwards, and. You know, they to see what they've achieved. You can only wish to sort of achieve like a tiny bit of what they have, and and I'll be happy. Do you know what I mean? I'm I'm very fortunate. My um my director of rugby London Scottish, Matt um, Matt Williams, he um he's given me um 
gave me a massive opportunity with China and said, look, we want to go to National 1. We're a National 2, a bottom National 2 club and just about avoided relegation the first time we worked together. Um, and he sort of came in mid and he kept me on. And we then, you know, we managed to get promoted out of National 2 through the playoff into National 1 and put them in the highest position they'd been in and finished fourth. And um, so he's, you know, I owe a lot to that guy in the sense that he's given me opportunities. And then he moved to London Scottish and he said, look, um, I'm going there. I want to take you with me. So I get a chance to coach at the championship this season, fingers crossed. Um, and and so I owe a lot to that guy as well. But, but you know, I've there's so many different people that you I could say I've been inspired by. You know, you talk about your Phil Jacksons and the Chicago Bulls and always sort of, you know, it's funny now seeing a lot of guys like they've really got into, like, they've seen the last dance, but they've never heard of Michael Jordan before. They've seen the, um, you know, the last dance and stuff like that. Or, you know, now everyone's wearing those Jordans, you know, like sort of Mark One Jordans and stuff. We, you know, as I was sort of growing up wearing those sort of things, you know, and it's just like, my sister came back from the States, remember the nights, she was like the only kid in town had everything with Chicago Bulls and stuff like that. So, so coaches like that, you know, uh, for me, uh, you know, you put them up here, don't you, because of what they've achieved. I read all the books about them and stuff like that. And I don't know, I'm not the kind of guy who will try and mimic any of that stuff. I went through a phase of being a bit of a shouty coach and, and all that kind of stuff. But I get, I get on better with my players, having a bit of rapport with them and a beer in the bar after and whatever, and try to sort of uh, uh, find, it, find that level with them really. And, and, and it seems to work, you know. And my final question before we wrap up the episode, Ricky, is if it, you had to summarise what we were speaking about into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? Oh, geez, that's a tough one, mate. What do you say? I think go back to what I was on my daughter is to be versatile, you know, be versatile and uh, be prepared to fail uh, to be able to sort of obviously progress yourself forward. So don't be afraid of, of failing at things, you know. That's probably the sentence. Don't be afraid to fail because everyone does it. It's just how you react to it, isn't it? And, uh, and build yourself up from there. So once again, Ricky, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. No, mate, thank you very much. And I have to say, you know, the well, I should have mentioned it a bit more as well, is, is obviously with the, the Brave Mind, the charity that we, we talk about, the mindset stuff as well, James. I know we didn't cover it, so maybe we, we have another opportunity to talk about that at some other point. But but those things are so important to us as well, mate. And I really would like that opportunity to talk about that again at some other point, because apart as a coach, that is something that for me is, is being a massive part of my life in players that transition out of the, the professional game into the amateur game and semi-pro and stuff like that. So it would be remiss of me not to mention them, Brave Mind and obviously the work that we're doing across the board as well. So, but I appreciate the chance to, to sit down and have a chat with you and I uh, hope we get to do it again, mate. Thanks again for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed this episode and got loads from it. Anything that was included and discussed will be available in the show notes below. And I would love to hear from you. Come and connect and ask your questions. I've been James Roberts from jamesowenroberts.com. Remember this quote by Chris Hoth. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think and execute not by some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete.